Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another virtual tour of outer space. My name is Josh. I have the privilege of being your presenter, your pilot, really, today. But as always on our Wednesday programs, you get to be the decider. You get to tell us where to go. You're the captain of our spaceship of the imagination. So we are here for a virtual tour of outer space in which we're going to fly around and visit the things you want to check out. But I wanted to start off this week in our open space software. You can see it hovering in that little window next to me with a few of the things people have been requesting over time. I spent some time over the past week trying to build in some of those features, and there's been some successes. There's been some non-successes along the way, but uh, we have a couple things that I've been wanting to show you for a while, and I can now do. And if you want to check out some of these exact same features, I encourage all of you to go to openspaceproject.com and download the exact same software I'm using, and you can use it yourself. Fly around. Give yourself a tour where you get to be pilot and commander of that spaceship. So if you go and check out the Open Space Project, there's actually a survey we would love for you to fill out. And the first 30 respondents get to have a super cool NASA sticker mailed to them so you can rep everyone's favorite governmental agency out in public. Uh, so we can actually get started right now. Uh, we are seeing open space. There you go. And looking down on planet Earth. Now, planet Earth in this software looks absolutely beautiful. You don't even have to have sunlight shining on it because of this wonderful species we have here on our planet called human beings. You can see where we spend a lot of energy on making light right along the Nile River. You can see a huge amount of human population all the way around in Italy. You can see the geography beautifully outlined through Europe all the way out to Ireland. Over here, you can see the Saudi Arabian Peninsula. Our planet is beautiful, even at night. Now, showing off the nighttime side of a planet is something a little special in our solar system. There's only one planet that really has visible features on the nighttime side. That's planet Earth. Everybody else is getting their light from the sun. And in fact, you can see the influence of sunlight on this part of the picture. Check out those glowing bands, our light that was captured by this satellite at noon when light was bouncing straight back up. You can see noon happened in multiple places because it takes a long time to image the entire planet. And actually, over here on the west coast, you can see just a little bit of sunlight still reaching us here. This is a view of around this time of day, but yesterday. You can see that the smoke from our wildfires is getting a little better. Thank you to our firefighters who are spending tireless effort to keep them under control. And you can also see the dark limb of night is getting closer and closer to us as we get closer and closer to our winter months. Since we passed our equinox, few weeks ago, you might have noticed it's getting a lot darker a lot earlier, and that dark line will be creeping closer and closer to us until eventually the west coast is shrouded in darkness, and we are part of our planet at night. Now, zooming back from planet Earth, we call this show Virtual Tour of Outer Space. If any of you want to give us a location on Earth you're tuning in from, we would love to hear it, or a suggestion of where we should be heading next. Those are great and appreciated as well. I've been thinking a lot about big scale astronomy stuff. One of our student uh, mentees is actually looking into a cosmology themed show. I'm really excited for it. But in the course of talking about that, we've been looking at big scale astronomy and that inspired me to do something that a lot of folks have requested. They wanna see big scale stuff. Now, previously I've taken you out to about here where you can see many of the stars closest to our own sun. That's a really cool view. I love doing this in the planetarium because when you fly out to a couple dozen, maybe almost 100 light years, and you just give it a slow rotation, you get that 3D space around us so beautifully. Now, when you're looking at these stars, they look completely alien. Once in a while, you'll see a familiar constellation drift into view, but only specific ones and only at specific angles, because from this far away, our constellations look completely different. We can give ourselves a little bit of a hint, though, if you want to keep track of our constellations. If you go into our menu here, we can go around and find our constellations marker right there. And all of a sudden, this crazy looking lines are telling us where our constellations are. So if you wanted to find one that looked a little familiar, let's see if we can line one up. Here's one a lot of people know, a very famous one, the Big Dipper. How do I know that's the Big Dipper? Well, it's part of Ursa Major. And you might be looking at that thing going, that's not the Big Dipper. I know what the Big Dipper looks like. And that, frankly, is not it. Well, check this out. Does this look a little more familiar? 
that's the dipper we know and love but that dipper is really only visible from our part of the galaxy right around our own sun you can see our very special little dipper up here with our north star right there if we pan around you might notice some of these constellations are in different colors a darker shade of red for these around here those are our zodiacal constellations the constellations of the zodiac and if we fly around them there are two very special ones I would like to point out. One of them is a zodiacal constellation. I should say the other one is not. The one that is not is this guy right here. That's a very famous constellation, Orion. And once the Academy is reopened, if you want to see some of our planetarium presenters show you the stars of Orion in a kind of similar way, come meet us in the garden at certain points during the day. But checking this out, you can see our Orion figure right there, the three stars of the belt, the club outstretched and a shield up in front of him to do battle with Taurus the bull. Now, the stars of Orion are kind of special to us because they are bright stars and they're relatively nearby. Opposite Orion, if we go about 180 degrees, a big flip, we can see this guy right here, Scorpius, the scorpion. Now, if you can find Scorpius, you can see his big long tail right there. Bing tells me that this is the constellation of the fish hook in some Polynesian cultures. So looking at this giant depiction of Scorpius in the sky, you'll notice it falls right on the Milky Way. Now we can actually use Scorpius and the constellation right next door, Sagittarius, to locate a very special part of our Milky Way called the galactic center point. The very middle of our galaxy is hiding out right around there, which means Orion, is facing directly away from the middle of our galaxy. Let's find Orion, the big blue constellation, back over here. You might be asking, Josh, why is your view upside down? And to that I will say, there is no such thing as up in space. But checking this out, we can actually follow the path of the Milky Way all the way over from where we saw it in Sagittarius and Scorpius over here out to Orion. Now, granted, it's a lot less visible out here. It's a little harder to see, but it is still there. Now, here, I think, is one of the coolest things we can do. Check out that blue constellation. That's Orion, and we're going to fly backwards. As we fly backwards, Orion starts to kind of melt and bend. But if we keep an eye on Orion and the very bright stars that make it up, remember, ignore this blue constellation, focus on this one we can see that they're facing away from our galaxy. Oh, I think I might have forgot to turn the, oh, there we go. The center of our galaxy, I should say. So all those bright stars of Orion are part of this little structure right here. Now that little structure is what we call the Orion Spur. And that's actually where we live in our galaxy. If you tilt our view this direction, you can see the center of our galaxy right there and that glowing bright area around it. Now, this should be one of the brightest parts of our sky, it's brighter than any other part of the Milky Way. So why can't we see this giant glowing single feature in the sky? Well, let's back in. And as we do, keep your eyes on that direction. As we settle in to the plane of our galaxy, you can see all that dark, cloudy gas and dust is actually blocking our view of the middle of our galaxy. If it weren't for that, we would get to see that brilliant glow that's kind of peeking around the edges and in a couple holes, but it's mostly blocked. And which constellations does that bright central area fall between? Scorpius right here and Sagittarius right here. So if you are a fan of the middle of our galaxy, the best time to see it is summer. And I hate to tell you, but summer is not approaching. Summer is rapidly receding from us. Granted, another summer will come again. But for right now, we are moving in towards winter. I'm not going to say winter is coming. I am a big fan of the Song of Ice and Fire, but I'll leave that joke out. So what we will get to see are the bright stars of Orion rising not too long after our sun sets. You do still have to wait a little while, but not too long. And when you see those bright stars of Orion, it is super cool to think about what we are actually seeing, some of the brightest stars nearest to us, and kind of the home team when we're talking about our galactic structure. Okay, so I've spent enough time talking about this big scale stuff. If there's something a little closer to home you want to check out, by all means, please throw us a suggestion. Otherwise, I'm going to go on, I think, a grand tour of moons. So 
If moons are not the thing you're excited about seeing right now, please throw something in the comments and I will very happily follow up. Let's get rid of our constellations because they can be a little distracting. Okay, so heading in, let's see. Where are we going to start off first? I think I've got a cool idea. Let's go check out around Jupiter. We often have folks suggesting or interested in some of the Galilean moons. And I now have all four loaded up nice that we can check out and experience up close and personal. Ooh, we have a suggestion for some planets popping up. I think Enrique and Gaynor are in uh, cahoots. We should go check out Mars. Okay, so quick stop then. We'll check out Europa. Europa does have a fun superlative. It has the most volcanoes of any non-Earth body in the solar system. It has tons of volcanoes. Where can we see some of these volcanoes? Better question is where can't we see some of these volcanoes? The entire surface of Io looks a lot like a pizza. And not the good kind of pizza, the bad kind of pizza. You can see a lot of different deposited areas where like one giant peak in the middle has laid a huge amount of material around it. You can see plumes and jets where a volcano has gone off and changed the landscape in its immediate surroundings. On first glance, whenever we look at a moon, we're tempted to call all of these things craters. The more appropriate word for at least the majority of them might be calderas, perhaps a related term, but these are where the bowl of a volcano would be, where material moving out of it has a chance to collect itself on the surface. Now, that's a lot of volcanoes to be sure, but if we want to see the biggest volcanoes in the solar system, and as Andy is suggesting, perhaps a spot where there could be some water, we actually have to go a little closer in. Now, that makes sense. When we get closer to the sun, we expect more radiant energy, more light coming from it, and therefore a warmer place. On the surface of Io or Europa, the ice moon, we should get a little bit of sunlight but not nearly as much as we get closer to the sun. And since Mars is much closer to the sun than Jupiter, we get a lot more light there. Now you can see some of that sunlight hitting it. And you got Mars's beautiful glow of an atmosphere right on the outside edge. Absolutely beautiful. You can also see some of these volcanoes coming into view. Now we make a big deal of four volcanoes on the surface of Mars, but you should never ever think that those are the only volcanoes Mars has. They are just so huge, so prodigiously awesome that we spend a lot of time talking about them. But Mars has plenty of evidence of volcanic activity, huge basalt deposits, and some spots where we think there might actually be evidence of water. Now, for some of those evidence, I will confess, if you want to see someone who really knows the surface of Mars, you should check out our Cosmic Conversations from, let's see, two weeks ago. We had Dr. Pascal Lee flying us around and showing us some truly amazing stuff. And boy, does he know Mars and how human beings are going to be exploring Mars in the not too distant future. So if we want to see most of Mars, I've actually got a little cheaty button stored in here. I can take away nighttime on Mars and reveal the entire surface, including those one, two, three, four giant volcanoes with this one, Olympus Mons, really dominating the landscape. But I can also take us in to some of the places where we are suspecting water on the surface of Mars, which are really amazing spots. Now, some of these are places we would want to send rovers, but some of them could be really challenging for rovers, especially places where we see the reoccurring slope lineae. Now, the reoccurring slope lineae, really awesome name for like a new wave sci-fi band, are dark features we see appearing on the slopes of some of the volcanoes and on the slopes of this great chasm we call Valles Marineris. Now on the sides of these slopes, there's an angled surface. And on that angled surface, from time to time, we see a dark line show up. That's what the linear means. It's just a line-like feature. Now what this really looks like is dark material from inside Mars flowing across the surface. And that's exciting because that means the surface of Mars is changing. Now that could be anything though, right? It could be iron-rich dark sand flowing across the surface. That's true, it could be, except that some of our spectroscopy analysis of the material seems to indicate the presence of water, or at least salts. And the temperature when these reoccurring slope lineae show up is right around zero Celsius. Now that's significant because at zero degrees Celsius, 
water is frozen solid. It's ice. But salt water would freeze at a slightly lower temperature. So when Mars reaches around zero Celsius, salt water could still be flowing. And that would mean that this could be salty brine flowing across the surface of Mars, which is tremendously exciting because we have salt-loving life here on Earth. I believe it's called halophilic life that can actually survive in intense brine, stuff that's too salty for other life. If you ever want to prove that life is not a huge fan of salt in extreme conditions, check out sauerkraut. Not that I don't love sauerkraut, but it's a great way for us to control the kind of life that exists in our food and allow it to change in a predictable way. Fermentation, it's called, as opposed to just rotting, which is when food goes bad. Now, the surface of Mars has tons and tons of these amazing impact features. Some of them have these cool collections of material on the bottom. Some of them could be places where water has accumulated. You can check out the Curiosity mission to find out more about their exploration of uh, Aeolus Mons, Mount Sharp, and some of the really cool stuff they've discovered there. Enrique wants to know, are any of these volcanoes on Mars currently active? Have we seen a volcanic eruption on Mars? No. That would be super cool. We think that most of Mars's geological activity happened a long time ago, probably billions of years ago. But there are some curious features that make people wonder if there couldn't be some residual heat inside Mars. That would be really cool. Actually really warm, I guess, not cool. But in looking inside Mars, there's actually some hope there could be a little bit of that tectonic activity, more earthquakes than eruptions, but still some activity left on Mars. So if we're looking for hot lava, Mars is probably not the place to look. If you're looking for a little bit of residual heat, maybe enough to keep some water liquid or something alive, then Mars might be an okay place. But again, that's still kind of speculation, not necessarily something that is set in stone. Ooh, there's a cool feature. When you think of a crater, what shape do you think of? Probably not this long, I don't know, sourdough bread loaf. Well, this is a very cool feature. I'm inclined to say this is probably a glancing blow from an object. Something came in at an angle, not straight down like these nice, perfect circular craters. That's really cool. I want to learn more about that feature. I really have no idea what could have caused something to look exactly like that. That would be a fun one to check out. It's a pretty big impact site, too, if that is, in fact, an impact site. Now, something to ask our experts sometime soon. Okay. Zooming back from Mars. I feel like I spent a lot of time there. I did. Any other objects you would like to check out? Any other suggestions for places we could view? Let's see. We spent a little bit of time on Mars. We talked a little bit about volcanoes. I'll tell you what. Let's see if we can spot some other icy, briny places. I was going to check out more moons of Jupiter. I'm heading back there. Let's go check out Europa. I mentioned this one in passing. Mars gets more light from the sun called insolation, if you want to be super fancy. That just means energy from Sol, the sun. Not insolation. That's a little different. That's what we don't have at my house. But when we talk about insolation, that's the amount of energy you're receiving. And Europa gets very little. So little that water would be pretty frozen. Now, looking around... On the surface, we can see some cracks. We can see some crisscross lines and features. This is a really beautiful spot. And if you want to learn more about the surface of Europa, tune in in about two weeks for our Cosmic Conversations. We're going to be talking a lot about some of these structures and seeing really cool stuff. That's Fridays at, oh gosh, 11.30. I almost said 1.30. That's a different program. Okay, so looking around, this icy surface is receiving energy, not from the sun, but from Jupiter's gravitational massage. As it travels around the giant planet Jupiter, Jupiter tugs on it, pulls it, stretches it, smushes it, smush being the operative scientific term. And over time, it imparts energy into it and keeps things pretty liquid moving around. And again, that kind of briny ocean is a possibility inside here and one of the most exciting spots in our solar system for this kind of briny stuff. Ooh, Jen LM wants to know if we can look at Neptune and see if it is raining diamonds. Now, Raining diamonds, that is such a cool mental image, right? Just imagine going outside and seeing precious gems falling from the sky. It's like a Lisa Frank binder come to life. But alas, this is 
while potentially, yes, there could be diamonds as a precipitate on the surface of Neptune, can we see them? Not in our resolution. We can see the surface. We can see some clouds on the surface. We can't really see individual, like, small things. But these could be very large diamonds, too. Some people call them diamond bergs. Imagine an iceberg of diamond floating around in here. Sounds pretty awesome, right? But again, our human imaginations are keen on running off with something. What we know is that the temperature, pressure, conditions, and composition here are likely suitable for carbon to bond together in the outer layers of Neptune. It's an ice giant, so there's all sorts of interesting stuff condensing inside it. But when we talk about a diamond, the first thing you have to remind yourself is who is there to cut those beautiful facets onto it? Nobody. So this would not be a beautiful shiny diamond like we're used to. It would be a big lump of carbon, more like a block of charcoal than a beautiful sparkling diamond, at least on the outside. Another thing would be that rain is maybe not the right term. A precipitate, it would float in this liquid and it would certainly condense and then drop. But if you're floating in a liquid, I have a hard time calling that rain. If something is falling from the sky through a gas, maybe you could call that raining, but the surface doesn't quite match what we're used to. So that idea of raining, while poetic, while beautiful, and while for sure striking, maybe not the most accurate. But if you want it accurate, I hate to say it, condensing blobs of carbony goo just doesn't capture the same beautiful mental imagery as raining chunks of diamond. Karen and Sun want to check out Saturn up close. I think we can certainly make that happen. Let's go check out Saturn. One parting thought on Neptune. I keep banging this drum because I would love for someone young out there to be inspired and take up this torch. We don't know what's happening inside Neptune because we haven't done all the lab work. There's a ton of ideas about what could be happening with that composition at that pressure, at that temperature, with that amount of insulation, the amount of energy coming from the sun. But... In order to understand the outer layers, you can get a little bit from telescopes. Underneath that, you need lab work. Underneath that, you need lab work and more lab work. We have a lot of research to be done before we really understand what's going on in our ice giants. But I shouldn't be talking about ice giants when we're looking at our beautiful gas giant Saturn. Saturn is just a different kind of planet. It's got those beautiful visible rings. You can see them right there. Uranus and Neptune do have rings. We can't see them in our software, but we can see Saturn's beautiful rings. These are, you might think, like a computer glitch. When we get to the edge, they just disappear. That's not. That is actually how thin these rings are. They disappear to nothing when you line up with them just right. If you want to see them from Earth, we might see an angle a little bit like this because we're always looking from the direction of the sun. When you look at a telescope towards Saturn, you will usually catch a view, not like you're seeing it up close and personal, maybe like this with a smaller telescope. You see a little dot with kind of a long thing around it. Through a more powerful telescope, you might see something like this. And often people wonder why it has two dark dots on it when you look at it through a telescope. Again, those aren't dots. Those are actually the dark spots we're seeing through the rings, between the rings and the planet. Zooming in, we can see those separations. We can also see other separations. This one, I believe, is called the Cassini Division, so named for its discoverer. And the name Cassini and Saturn kind of go hand in hand these days, like Hubble and cosmology, because one of our most famous Saturn exploring missions was given the name Cassini. Also, Huygens was the probe that was dropped down on Titan, gave us some beautiful stuff. So, Jeremiah, I hope you are able to appreciate just how beautiful and wonderful our Lord of the Rings and our own solar system is. That is a Song of Ice and Fire reference and a Lord of the Ring reference in the same show. I hope I don't get fired. Okay. Runaway greenhouse effect on Venus. Sounds cool. Let's head out there. Venus's atmosphere has been in the news a lot recently because of some discoveries there. But we actually can trace back a lot of our knowledge about how planets change to early observations of Venus. Now, I believe, and Bing is producing for me, correct me in the comments if I'm wrong, please do. When we first learned about the temperature of Venus's atmosphere, 
and a little bit about the surface temperature was the work of an enterprising young astronomer in, I believe, the 60s or 70s named Carl Sagan. Now, he was learning a lot about Venus, what the temperature variation was like, how things change. A really cool mission, to be sure. But in learning about it, they also kind of came up with the idea that this much carbon in the atmosphere makes a planet hot. Now, this works in a really simple way. Sunlight, again, that insulation, this turned out to be the theme of our show today, strikes Venus, and a lot of that light bounces off, but not all of it. Some of it reaches its way down to the surface, although very little. That light strikes the surface and is converted into heat in a process we are familiar with. If you've ever stood outside in the sun and you feel warm, sunlight strikes your body and is converted into heat. That heat would normally escape a planet in the form of infrared light. But you see carbon, the stuff wrapped around Venus as its atmosphere, blocks infrared. That means it keeps a lot of infrared out from the sun, but it does also block the infrared that got uh, the light that got turned into infrared on the surface, so it traps that heat close to the surface. And this becomes unsustainable very quickly. Since that infrared can't escape, the surface just gets hotter and hotter and hotter. And as such, we see what's called a greenhouse effect, because we use the exact same idea of one direction sunlight. Sunlight goes in and can't escape in our greenhouses here on Earth as a great way for us to keep trap of the temperature inside a place to grow plants that like hotter weather, our greenhouses. Okay, can we take a look at Mercury? Absolutely, Shayama. Let's head out there right now. That's only one planet closer, a quick hop, skip, and a jump. And I believe Mercury might actually be visible not too long after the sun sets. If you are eager to see planets with your own eyeballs, I cannot recommend highly enough tuning in tomorrow at 1.30, where Bing is going to tell us about the stuff we can see in our night sky. So if you want to see some of these things for yourselves or get tips on when you can see them, tune in tomorrow and listen to Bing tell us about all the cool stuff happening in our sky. Now, looking at Mercury, you might think, Josh, you screwed up. We flew to the moon. Not the case. I have screwed up many times in these, but this is not one of them. I recognize Mercury. We can see that beautiful gray surface, those strange white rings. These are craters, too but these are craters with ejecta around them. Ejecta, for those of you who never lived in the age of CDs or cassettes, is that little button you push and makes the thing pop out. That's actually eject. We don't do that anymore since we don't have physical media. But the ejecta was stuff that popped out from the surface when an object struck and flung material all around. Now, we can see some craters don't seem to show us ejecta. Others do. That might have to do with the velocity of the object, the recentness of the impact. There's a lot of potential factors, even the composition of the rocket struck. But all of these things add up together to mean that we have a very different surface on different parts of Mercury. We can learn an awful lot from these beautiful craters. Now, one thing we learned from Brian Day, who's a scientist at NASA at Ames, about when you look at a crater, you can actually tell a little bit about the size of the impact from the shape. Check out this super huge crater. It's got what we call a double wall feature. There's one wall closer in, one wall farther out. There's actually this cool shattering that happened down here on the surface, probably where the surface was liquid, and then as it cooled, cracked. That's a guess. I would want to double check that. But when you're looking at this double wall crater, you can actually see something kind of like this on Earth, at least if you scan the surface through what we call gravimetrics. Now, in scanning the surface, we discovered an impact kind of like this, that double wall structure right on the tip of the Yucatan Peninsula. And this is an impact that happened about 66 million years ago. And if that date sounds familiar, it's because we think that was the impact that uh, preceded the disappearance of the dinosaurs, probably very closely related. Ooh, Jeremiah's got one last toughie for me. Can we see a black hole up close? Alas, no. And that's not just a limitation of me or the software. Seeing a black hole is something that is a very challenging thing to do. Some people have made very cool simulations you can check out online of what it would look like by a black hole. And Jeremiah might want to wait a few years, but there was a wonderful movie that did a great simulation. That was... Ba -ba 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 -ba, trying to remember. You know, the one had Matthew... No. I'm terrible with actors. 
Bing remembers, he's going to put it in the comments. He's laughing at me. Interstellar, that's the one. Uh, but Interstellar did a great black hole simulation made by the inestimable Kip Thorne. So if you wanted to see the most scientifically accurate depiction of what a supermassive black hole would look like that is rapidly rotating, that's an important factor, you can check out that movie. Absolutely super cool. I can show you maybe one last time where a supermassive black hole lives inside our galaxy. Check out, remember this direction? You can see Sagittarius right here. I can see the tail of Scorpius right there. So let's fly back. And as we do, keep your eyes on that part. We're going to go see that glow again. And that's going to show us where the central bulge of our own Milky Way galaxy resides. That is some of the oldest stars around. And check out that glowing bulge. If we look right to the middle, there's this huge central bulge. It looks like a solid thing, but it's not. We're seeing so many stars packed so close together that it kind of looks like one thing, but it's like looking at a soccer field. You don't see individual blades of grass, you just see green. When we look down here, we just see white because of all the stars that reside there. But if you were to point a telescope right to the very middle, you'd see that there was something there. The stars, many of the stars are orbiting. Not all of them, but many of them. And when you look at them, some of those stars are moving very quick. Those quick moving stars are orbiting something that we can't see. Now, what could be very heavy, making stars orbit around it very quickly, and pretty much invisible? A black hole. And not just any black hole, a supermassive black hole, Sagittarius A star. So Sagittarius A star is the one that resides within our own galaxy. And if you check out our cosmic conversations with a super cool astronomer named Dr. Adrienne Cool, she can tell you about some of the other galaxies we're studying, even dwarf galaxies that might have supermassive black holes of their own. But I feel like I went, I did go one minute over. Thank you all for tuning in. I'm sorry I went long this time. I hope I was able to address some of the things you have asked for in the past. If there are more things you want to check out or see in open space, you can download it yourself or hold on to those ideas and bring them for our next week's discussion. The Academy of Science is opening again relatively soon. I believe on the 23rd, we're going to be open to the public. So come check it out. We would love to see some of your faces. Me and my team cannot wait to get back and resume our planetarium operations. And if we don't get to see you again in soon in person, we hope that we do get to see you online. So thank you again for tuning in. Have a wonderful rest of your day today on Wednesday. And stay safe, stay happy, stay healthy. We'll see you again soon.